Okay, excellent. All right, good morning, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join us uh, for this webinar. Um, this will cover lubrication um, from a perspective of um, lubrication management and also how it is connected to condition-based maintenance and also looking into the future, or not the future, but into what is coming in terms of connectivity and the Internet of Things. But firstly, I would like to begin with um, causes and costs of poor lubrication and what effect it can have on a plant, a business, etc. So if we start to look at um, root cause analysis and what are the major contributors to uh, premature failures of bearings, it is quite often obvious to see from, uh, from this slide here that lubricant contamination um, lubricant chemical degradation and wrong like, like wrong lubricant type or grade uh, are the main contributors in terms of poor lubrication. Um, this, this data you see here is taken from an independent study. Um, so keeping that in mind, if we also look at this next slide, which is uh, SKF data, um, bearing in mind that SKF has been manufacturing bearings for over 100 years now, during that time, we've also been testing um, testing bearings and taking data in relation to what causes bearings to not reach their, their life. So you can see from, from this slide here, again, contamination and poor lubrication um, contributes to 50% of, of bearing failures, 50%. Then you have fatigue, obviously, and poor fitting. So fatigue uh, may be related to bearings not um, specified correctly, which you may have seen in Dario's previous um, presentations, or poor fitting of the bearing where you're not using the correct tools for fitting. Taking that into consideration again, and I'll say this again, 50% are related to lubrication and contamination. So, if we look at the point of view from the overall picture, the global manufacturing market obviously is changing. And this means to your specific companies, it's, it's you know, the reduction in cost per tonne or per piece. So when you take that into, into consideration in mind, you need to really start to consider this type of data. Now, if we start to look at what a typical maintenance budget may look like, it is broken down into these components, which is uh, lubricants, lubrication, um, components for machines, other miscellaneous materials, labour, and then overtime labour. And of course, 40% of this is influenced by lubrication activities. But if you have a look at the overall budget, lubrication really is only about 1% to 3% of the cost of the overall budget, but it has such a huge impact. So I think um, it's very important to keep that in mind when you're considering lubrication um, how it is practiced, lubrication management, and how it is uh, connected to other parts of the business. So as we're saying, on average, lubricant purchases amount to about 3%, a mere 3%. But approximately 40% of the total maintenance cost, however, is influenced by lubrication activities. In addition to the lubricant costs, half of the acquired components lu require lubrication. Overtime labour is mostly a result of machine failures typically caused by inadequate lubrication. And about 5% of labour costs can be attributed to lubrication activities. Root cause failures such as wrong or inadequate lubricant, um, inadequate quantities and frequencies, inadequate practices and processes, contamination and cross-mixing. Um, that's very important and something we'll touch on moving forward. Lack of knowledge and or interest. Why do I actually do this lubrication task? What are the implications if I get it wrong? And complacency. And of course, most of them could be a combination of all those factors. So moving forward, what is lubrication management? What does lubrication really encompass? Well, if we look at this slide here where it says the lubrication point, it really is made up of all these different aspects in terms of management program, asset inspection, condition monitoring, lubricant analysis, even logistics, 
the lubricant itself, storage and handling, which is which is critical, physical application of lubricants, contamination control, which is critical, waste handling, which is very important in terms of the environment and regulations, training and skills, strategies, strategies and tribology. So it really is quite a um, big picture um, for lubrication. And, and this can mean diff many different things to different people, but it's, it is the compilation of many, many activities which makes up lubrication. Lubrication is not simply the act of putting oil or grease in a machine. There's much more than that. Many of the above points can have an influence on the success of a condition-based maintenance program in that they can impact the condition and quality of the lubricant and have a huge effect on ingress of contamination, selection of correct lubricant, and the correct quantity of lubricant. So what does it mean in reality? This is pictorially what it can mean. Contamination ingress, inadequate lubrication tools, leakages, under lubrication, over lubrication, safety issues, contamination. Effect and efficient organisation of resources in order to reduce machine failures, inefficiencies and injuries related to lubrication. And it covers everything we've just discussed. How do we enable reliable rotation? Well, a lot of people know this four, five, six R approach. Today with, with uh, the internet of things and connectivity, we now have a stage of the six R approach. So you must have the right lubricant selection. You must have the right amount, lubrication interval. You must have the right system. And that could, that could mean um, use of a grease gun, it could mean, mean the use of a single point lubricator or it could mean use of a fully automatic um, lubrication system. And it might even be in, in the near future, or it can be now, a connected lubrication system with monitoring. <laughs> At the right time, so we know that the most optimum way to uh, lubricate a bearing is while it's moving, but in, mo in a lot of instances, it's not possible to do that to the right lubrication point. So we are putting the right lubricant in the right place and we are not forgetting lubrication points because they're hard to access or can't be seen, etc. And then, as I said, with the right lubrication connection, and that may incorporate some connectivity where we're monitoring grease flows or we're monitoring oil flow rates, etc. Of course, the lubrication management, pro pro um, management uh, process that we've just discussed is a combination of all this. Tasks and planning, scheduling, procedures, training, as in personnel development, program management and KPIs. We incorporate the six hours of lubrication coupled with a lubrication management program. We are well and truly on our way to best practice lubrication in general. So if we look at storage and handling, for example, this is what I'm talking about. One of the first places to work on, it could be a small investment which can potentially have big rewards. Prevent contamination ingress as much as possible. Inspection material needed, which, which storage condition. Gives a good idea. Moving forward from sto poor storage to best practice should be the goal and the rewards can be enormous. I mean... Um, this is not this is not a joke when you see stuff like this. I've actually seen um, places in my travels where this actually happens. Identification best practice in order to prevent cross contamination, in order to prevent incorrect lubricant usage, in order to know where each lubricant is used and in what quantity. Dedicated intermediate storage containers will assist with this, and again, will have a big impact on. Uh, contamination issues and incorrect lubricant usage. Lubrication selection and application methods. Different applications require different methods. Um, different applications uh, have different problems and issues associated with it. So choosing the correct lubricant and application and method is imperative. Contamination and condition control, I'll keep going on about this. Contamination exclusion, removal, identification. 
Lubricants can get contaminated through seals, vents and handling, storage and handling, again. An example, water contamination. An example of contamination control, we may decide to ensure that all bulk oil tanks, for example, are fitted with breathers to prevent ingress of airborne contamination or moisture. Um, oil sampling and analysis program. Oil analysis, as you know, is the blood analysis of a machine. It can provide information on machine health, lubricant health. Important steps though, is sampling positions. You must choose the correct sampling position when you're taking uh, oil samples. How often you do it, frequency. Test slate development. So what types of tests are you going to have uh, run on your lubricant? Um, what alarm levels will be set? for you to know when to act, react, to take action, and then reports and corrective actions. Huge impact on condition-based maintenance training of oil analysis ve is very powerful in providing insight into machine health and can very rarely be an alarm to an impending failure, condition-based maintenance. The problem I, that I've seen in my time is that many reports are received and they're not acted upon and unfortunately are just filed in the bottom drawer. Inspection, again, uh, still part of the lubrication management program, still part of the lubrication route where inspection, listening, hearing, seeing is, is noted and reports made within the lubrication um, processes. Health, safety and disposal, ensuring that we're complying to regulations in terms of disposal of waste lubricants, um, safety for personnel, etc. So all forms part of the lubrication management program. Constant improvements, taking away potential safety hazards, in, in, um, installing um, improved ways of, of conducting lubrication in general. Then obviously we need lubrication routes, plans and designs. The summary of all data that's collected previously, which is the loop point type frequency, testing, contamination control, et cetera, based on machine, can be based on machine criticality. Uh, lots of activities that need planning and scheduling, advising the loop technician what, where, and how it is to be done. And I can, I can assure you uh, in this day and age, there are still many companies that are operating without CMMS programs and uh, utilizing Excel spreadsheets, which are, may be uh, functional, but not the most optimum way of doing it. Procedures and training, um, obviously procedures to explain how things are done, why they're done, where it's done, and training, which is generally overlooked for some reason, to help a person, a technician, understand why do I put grease into a bearing? What does NLGI mean? Um, what is the difference between a lithium soap and a calcium grease. Um, what happens if I do mix the grease? Can I use the same oil in every gearbox? What's the difference between ISO VG150 and ISO VG220? What happens if I mix synthetic oil with mineral oil? Uh, when should I use synthetic oil? And the list goes on and on. But uh, this is important that lubrication people understand why they are doing things in certain ways and what happens if, if things are mixed up. So what is lubrication management? Process, people, technology, and that's what will lead to success. The success is the reflection of the underlying process, the technology and culture. The process is the planning, training, skills, management, root cause analysis, etc. Culture, ownership, expectation, reward systems, and then finally the technology can be manual, automated, or CMMS systems, as long as it works for you. So that's, in a nutshell, very, very quickly, the lubrication management program. Then if we look at condition-based monitoring and lubrication, we already know that bad lubrication is a contributor to machine failures and inefficiencies, which has a huge impact on plant capacity, costs, et cetera. Um, it can be a contributor to injuries. Access to lubrication points can be dangerous, as I alluded to previously. Lubrication of bearings um, generally is optimised while the bearing is in operation, and we know that sometimes uh, 
this is not possible, where safety guards must be removed, etc. So looking at good lubrication, maybe um, putting an auto loop system in places like that, or maybe a, a single point lubricator on a remote line or something like that. The environmental impact, we can have leakages, overconsumption, incorrect disposal, and, and so on. What do we need to measure in terms of bad lubrication? Is it machine uptime? Is it injury rates? Um, is it cost savings? Is it sustainability? What other, what other factors are there? Several measures can in fact be converted into quite huge savings. As an example, a machine hydraulic shovel study. A Hitachi 2500 shovel, um, annualized savings of nearly $100,000. So what was the issue? Four premature pump failures in 27 months, which, which was basically 20,000 per exchange, 34,000 per event production losses equals opportunity cost. There was 42 hose failures, severe oil oxidation, um, servo valve failures, et cetera. The effect of good lubrication practices was pump change every two years, which extended the mean time between failure, um, that they, they achieved the better ISO cleanliness of the oil, which improved the life cycle of the oil, which eliminated four pump replacements and servo valves and increased productivity of the excavating operation. So again, just an example of good lubrication practices. Machine-based maintenance. Although the benefits of detecting machine wear or aging lubricants are important, they're not as high as on the important scale compared to failure avoidance. Failure avoidance can be related to fluid contamination, as we keep saying, implementation of filters, handling and storage of lubricants to prevent ingress of contaminants. Remembering 50% of premature bearing failures is attributed to poor lubrication. Wrong oil, that means implementation of handling and storage, dedicated intermediate containers, correct labelling of lubrication points, adequate lubrication routings and instructions. Additive degeneration, which means oil and analysis program that can actually make use of the reports provided. Contamination control needs to be proactive. Just like a bearing, a gear or a valve, a lubricant should be considered as part of the working component of a machine. Uh, one should not just install a dirty or damaged bearing on a piece of equipment using wrong tools. You don't do that. Damaged lubricants should not be added to a machine, just the same way as, as damaged components or incorrectly installed components. Compression to failure, equipment failure cycle. So again, it's referring to ingress of contaminants and other oil contamination, which increases the rate of fluid degradation. Contamination and poor fluid quality cause increased wear. Eventual equipment failure is inevitable. This again can be prevented with an oil analysis program and a CBM program, which again is part of this overall lubrication management system. The progression to failure cycle can be reduced or eliminated by incorporating good lubrication practices into a condition-based program. And an oil analysis program in combination with other activities will go a long way to achieving prevention of progression to failure. Remember, there's always more than one root cause for failures, poor alignment and balance, poor lubricant contamination control, shock loading and overloading, poor lubricant selection and chemical health. Remembering though, that 50% of premature bearing failures are attributed to poor lubricant contamination control and poor lubricant selection and chemical health. All right, so that's a bit about uh, lubrication management and um, condition-based monitoring. Now quickly, we'll just move into industry 4.0 and lubrication today. So with the advent of industry 4.0, the internet of things and connectivity, lubrication now becomes far more useful in terms of monitoring and lubrication based on condition, and not on time or proactivity. Lubrication can actually be triggered by parameters such as vibration or heat, or in the case of low or high level oil flows in a circulating system and be adjusted accordingly. Future capability may be to monitor oil cleanliness and or presence of water in real time, which I don't think is too far away. 
So in this example here, you're seeing an oil circulating system with a pumping station being pumped up through to digital flow meters, which has the ability to capture flow rates, um, high and low levels, oil temperatures and, and oil cleanliness eventually. Send that data to the cloud, which can be analysed by our technicians and provide feedback to the customer. Again, as previously noted, grease lubrication can also be monitored with grease flow detectors. Grease lubrication systems may also be monitoring signals indicating excessive vibration or heat. At this time, a lubrication cycle may be triggered to prevent a failure. This data can also be sent to the cloud and be diagnosed at our, one of our centres, which can then be acted upon. Real-time and remote monitoring to prevent unplanned, unplanned downtime. So this is just quickly showing how this system can operate and what can be achieved. Investment in connected lubrication can be paid back within nine to 15 months. And again, the overall lubrication pro program will equal reduced downtime, costs and improvement to the environment. All right, that is the end of the show, Ranges. Um, do we have any questions? <laughs>